Coming up, 2022 is the year of the midterm elections. One expert breaks down how to run for public office. Plus, the State of Indian Nations from President Fawn Sharp. And Molly of Denali learns about an Alaska Native civil rights leader. I am Aaliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from the ICT newscast. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is a proud supporter of Indian Country Today. Students at Cronkite News and Gaylord College at the University of Oklahoma cover indigenous communities together. This important work is distributed by more than 100 news organizations. This collaboration provides a much needed boost to coverage of Native American communities nationwide. Learn more at cronkitenews.azpbs.org. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Kuatsi Hopa. Thank you for joining us. The nation's largest and oldest organization representing tribal nations met virtually on Monday. The National Congress of American Indians, also known as NCAI, held its annual State of Indian Nations Address and its Executive Council Winter Session. The session was kicked off by NCAI President Fawn Sharp, who outlined Indian Country's priorities in 2022. No matter the challenges, Native people have risen to the occasion. Our ancestors have gifted us with their wisdom, with their strength, and with their tenacity. Their will to protect our communities is embedded within our DNA. We all have a role to play. U.S. Representative and Ho-Chunk citizen Sharice Davids gave a congressional response. Interior Secretary Deb Holland also addressed tribal leaders, as well as other officials from President Joe Biden's administration. Topics of discussion included broadband initiatives addressing climate change, COVID-19 recovery, and access to voting. In Kansas, Indigenous students are celebrating a legal win to protect the rights of journalists. Last week, a district court judge ordered Haskell Indian Nations University to reform the way it protects the rights of student journalists. The litigation came after a year-long effort by Jared Nally, who is the former editor-in-chief of the school newspaper The Indian Leader. He says the university's former president, Ronald Graham, interfered in the newspaper's ability to report stories and withheld funding. Nally said that because indigenous schools are overseen by federal law, this makes basic freedom of expression difficult. And if we're going to continue to have this model, we need to look at approaching our government, um, our offices and asking or looking at these policies and making sure that we are in line with what is out there for um, public education. Nally said his newspaper covered stories on rising student fees and COVID-19 updates. Following a judge's order, the university is now forbidden from retaliating against the coverage of its student journalists. Haskell is also required to pay $40,000 in attorney fees. When Jolana Begay Krupa was a young girl, she knew she wanted to compete for the title of Miss Navajo. Her dream came true in 2001. Then she wrote a children's book about her experience. As Patty Tholohongva reports, her book, which was written in both English and Navajo, was recently honored by the American Library Association. My first glimpse of Miss Navajo was at the age of seven years old at the Navajo Nation Fair. From that moment, I wanted to be like her. And so when Jolana Begay Krupa was 20, she entered the Miss Navajo pageant. One of the unique aspects is the sheep butchering contest. It reflects a skill that's highly valued in her culture. And even though she grew up butchering sheep, it was still nerve wracking. The part of, that made me so nervous was that um, it's all, you know, all by yourself. You get no help. Uh, so my grandmother couldn't say, this is the next part. This is what we do. She ended up winning the pageant. Now, more than 20 years later, her book talks about her experience. 
So the name of my book in English is Becoming Miss Navajo. And in, in, in Navajo, it is She loved reading as a youngster and wondered why she couldn't find books that showed her people. Well, when I submitted the manuscript, they asked, like, how do you feel about having one book only in Navajo? And I was blown away by that idea. I'm like, I love it. Yes. She's very committed to helping others learn the language to keep the culture alive. She's the interim director of the Phoenix Indian Center. They offer Navajo language classes, and she also teaches at both Arizona State and Stanford University. And we have to be the one to make those changes. It's not, you know, anybody else's job but our own. And so I feel like that's my responsibility is to continue to try to teach what I know. And so that's why I do what I do. <laughs> it's a promise, she says, she made to her grandparents to pass on the language. <laughs> In Phoenix, Patty Thalahungva, ICT News. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Coming up, have you ever wondered how to run for public office? Stay tuned for more. Later this year, on November 8th, voters will head to the polls to vote in the 2022 midterm elections. Already, all across Indian country, Native people are announcing their candidacy for various seats. Joining us today is Anathea Chino, who is the co-founder and executive director of Advanced Native Political Leadership. The organization aims to increase Native representation in political offices across the country. Hi, Anathea. Thanks for being here today. Gawatsi, Hopa. It's so wonderful to be here. It's an honor. Thank you. So let's start off with the basic information. If someone was interested in running for political office, what are the things they need to know? It's such a big question. First, you want to ask yourself with a few questions. Do you have a strong understanding of the commitment? Do you have the time? Most offices require sometimes late evening meetings. They have, often have, depending on the office, 30, 60, day, um, 30, 60 90 day sessions. Uh, you also want to know what the salary is. Will it be a financial hardship for you? And will you need to supplement your income or make adjustments with your current employer? Um, one of the barriers for running for office is the inability to take prolonged leave from work. So really understanding what a citizen legislature means. And if you know that you'll be having to like volunteer for a certain number of period to be a public servant is actually a really big ask. Um, additionally, you want to know what your support network looks like because it's so critical that you have people around you that know what your ambition looks like and is going to support you along the way. So this looks like conversations with your partners, with your close friends, with advisors, the circle of what we call the kitchen cabinet of people that are going to be around you and help to make some really tough decisions in the beginning and support you for the launch. And then when you're ready to move on to the next step, it's important you do some research. And this looks like can look as going as close as like your local county county clerk's office, either in person or online, as well as the Secretary of State's office. Depending on the office you're running for, you can also go to places like Ballotopia that's online, it's an online research. And the National Conference of State Legislatures also has some information. Um, and additional things that you want to look out for are like what are the positions that are available in the place that you live? So there's a number of places that you can look online where you can put in your address, it will give you a list of all of the positions that are elected positions in your neighborhood. And then you want to look at like who currently holds that office, how much money was spent on that role. So you have an idea of how much you need to fundraise in order to run for the position. And you really want to understand the political leanings, have the person that is currently holding the office, are they either running again, so you know that there's going to be an incumbent race, or are they stepping out and it's going to leave an open position so there is more of 
a level playing field. And then you're able to like better understand the politics of like, were they representing your community? And if they weren't, then that helps you build your positioning to be able to establish a relationship with your constituency. Let's say hypothetically that all of these checklists were ticked off for a particular person and they said, you know what, I want to move forward and I want to run for this office. How does someone build a candidate platform and sort of choose the team to surround them through this election process? It's such a big question. I think you're going to go to the people that you've been in community with in your network, assuming that you have been either a volunteer, you've been active with your either like your school, you've been uh, an active participant with the local government or either local systems that have been involved in politics in your neighborhood. And you're going to go to those people that you know are already community leaders and ask for their advice, ask for their support. And you're making sure that you're doing the early work before you announce to better understand what is required. Do you have to gather petition signatures? Do you have to gather $5 donations? Do you have to gather like um, a number of support from local leaders in order to endorse and move forward? So the early work before you were actually thinking of running for office is establishing the relationships with the leaders that are in your community. This could be in your neighborhood. This could be in your city. This could be in the state. There are a number of people. There are, are also organizations that are working with both kind of like a binary party system. If you're looking at Republicans or Democrats, if this is required in your state that you're going to the local political leaders offering to them that you have some like a political trajectory and you have some goals that you want to move towards being they will then help guide you and the direction that you need to in order to have those early conversations with people there's a ton of work that happens before you actually announce your candidacy and there's a number of different checklists that we can that we can also provide for you at advanced native political leadership but there's a number of resources available online as well I actually would love to explore that more. I'd love to talk about resources that are available to Native people who want to run for office. You know, I feel like, so Advanced Native Political Leadership was founded in 2016, and it was founded because there was a lack of resources, particularly around um, ensuring that Indigenous people and Native people were going to have access to political resources that all other communities um, had. So at Advanced Native Political Leadership, we created the Native Leadership Institute. We are now the premier organization in the country that is doing recruiting and training Training. We have quarterly trainings. We just held our first one in December of 2021. We wrapped that one up in January of 2022 this year. We will have three more through the end of the year. These are national trainings. We had Lieutenant Governor of Minnesota, Peggy Flanagan, join us for the first one. We also had Congresswoman Cherise Davids join us for the first one. So we have people that are very much invested in their own local political systems that are making making sure that Indigenous people have access to the same resources and are getting a quality curriculum. Uh, there's also a number of state-based organizations, native state-based organizations that are running additional programming. We are also in communication with them and helping to support them and building up their curriculum. So you can start very local or you can come to advanced native political leadership. Well, Anathia, we could talk about this all day, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Have a wonderful day. ICT's Colby Kicking Woman covered the Executive Council Winter Session hosted by the National Congress of American Indians. The virtual event happened on Monday, and he joins us now with more insights. Hi, Colby. Welcome to our newscast. Hi, Leah. Thanks for having me. So one of the highlights of the Winter Session was the State of Indian Nations Address. Tell us how that went. Uh, yeah, great question. Uh, President Fawn Sharp of the National Congress of American Indians uh, move through a number of uh, move through a number and discuss a number of things in her speech. I think one of the uh, biggest takeaways was uh, her call on tribal leaders across the country to build a momentum from the last year. Uh, she said that the inclusion of tribes and in a public and political discourse has never been higher. 
uh, with the Biden administration, with the Biden administration. And, you know, like that all kind of started with his presidential me memorandum on tribal consultation, uh, I think in his first or second week in office. Uh, one line that stuck out to me uh, in her speech was that, you know, America is only as strong as its tribes and uh, historic investments in Indian country, uh, you know, from the infrastructure package and uh, and IHS, you know, they're making a difference uh, in Indian country and are will continue to do so moving forward. Uh, you know, she commended the Biden administration for uh, two federal native judges appointed, uh, one in Washington state and uh, another in California. Uh, and of course, the, there was the historic appointment of, of Deb Holland as a uh, interior secretary. Uh, so she definitely moved through a lot. And while she commended the Biden administration uh, for a number of things and efforts that they put forward uh, that, you know, there are still things uh, in progress to be made and be done. But, you know, I think a big overarching theme throughout the speech was uh, tribal leaders in Indian country seizing the moment and, and continue to build on the progress that has been made in the past year. Um, one of the other parts of, of the NCAI winter session on Monday was uh, Congresswoman Sharice Davids, who gave a congressional response. What did she have to say? Yeah, the, one of the things I enjoy most about uh, Congresswoman Davids is, you know, her pure joy and friendship that she has with Secretary Holland. Uh, in her speech, she kind of joked that uh, uh, Secretary Holland left her in Congress after they were the first two women uh, voted uh, into, into the House of Representatives. So it's always kind of fun to, to see her, her joy and, and how much mutual respect they have for, for each other. Uh, but she also echoed a lot of the sentiments made by President Sharp uh, and wanted to ensure those that were watching, you know, that the voices of Indian country are being heard in Washington, D.C. She talked a lot about uh, her work in the uh, Congressional Native American Caucus. Uh, I believe she's a vice chair with uh, Representative Tom Cole and the work that they do to educate everyone in Congress about the federal uh, trust responsibility and that every member of Con every member of Congress has an obligation to uh, understand and be educated on that federal trust responsibility. You know, she touched on a number of things that are uh, bills that are moving through Congress or, or that she has reintroduced, like the Native American Voting Rights Act, and encourage everyone you know, to call their senators and, and representatives and that the strength of Indian country is when we come together. And that since the bar has been raised, we need to, we need to keep it there and, and continue our advocacy um, across the nation. Colby, how do you think that this year's conference was different than past years? Well, for one, it seems uh, shorter. I know I think this is the second consecutive year that they've done it virtually. Uh, normally, tribal leaders uh, from across the country would convene in Washington, D.C. and, you know, uh, do conference events and, and meet with other tribal leaders. Uh, and then towards the end of the week, I know NCAI has a big emphasis on, um, you know, teaching tribal leaders the, the workings, the inner workings of Capitol Hill and getting them to meet with their different rep representatives. And so, According to their agenda, it was only uh, the one day yesterday, uh, but you know, you hope it was the one good day. Uh, and I will say that one thing that is definitely noticeable um, from the pandemic is just how savvy tribes and everyone has gotten when it comes to working Zoom and stuff. And so that's good that they're able to pull it off in a, in a very smooth fashion. Colby, while we have you here, we only have a short time left, but I know that you're a big football fan. Um, I want to give you the opportunity to talk about the Walker River Paiute star, Austin Corbett, winning the Super Bowl. What was your reaction? I mean, obviously, I was super pumped. Uh, and now I'm thinking that I might have to get myself an Austin Corbett jersey. Uh, hopefully he stays around for a couple of years so I can make that happen. It was a great game. Uh, obviously, I'm, as a Rams fan, I had a lot of fun watching it. Uh, I'm not superstitious. I could say I'm a little stitious. So now I can cut my hair and, and, and shave my beard. Not the playoffs are over, uh, but it was a, a <laughs> lot of fun. And, and obviously, congratulations to, to Austin Corbett and, and himself and, and, and the Walker River Paiute tribe, you know, that they, are, they all share in, in that victory. Sure. Well, Colby, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And we'll be right back.
February 16th is Elizabeth Paratrovich Day in Alaska. The PBS Kids series Molly of Denali celebrates this holiday along with two of the native creatives, Princess Johnson and Yetta Bay Evans. I spoke with them late last year. Initially, when we set out to do this series, we knew that this was something that we really hadn't seen or done before. And so we wanted to really aim for making each story as authentic as possible. And so, so much of the first season was really learning the process of animation, which goes very quickly <laughs> and doing our best to like keep up with that freight train of production, making sure that um, our stories started with um, our Alaska Native Advisory Group and the Alaska Native writers that we had at that time, which weren't many. It was myself and Vera Starbird. And, um, and we really set out to um, recognize that and build our capacity as um, Alaska Native people, whether that be through production, through voiceover, through the writing process. So we had to create those opportunities and really build our capacity to get to the place where we are today. Growing up here in Alaska can be quite challenging uh, through racism and stereotypes that are still prevalent throughout our society. And I experienced quite a bit of racism as a child and uh, wanted to set out to make a difference for our young people early on and really share that we are incredible, talented, resilient, loving, kind people, and we have a lot to give to this world. And so I, I went into the field of education and um, you know, helped to teach a lot of other educators about our history and how to relate to families uh, through cross-cultural communication. And now it has come, uh, I believe, full circle through Molly of Denali and the experiences that we're able to share through the shows. What's most meaningful to me is hearing from parents um, of indigenous children, how all of a sudden after watching Molly, they're more interested in their language, in their native language. They're more interested in wanting to wear their regalia and dance and practice our culture. And just this sense of being seen. And I will never forget at our premiere, we had a big, uh, we had the drum group come up and my boys are typically shy and they don't like to get up in front of people, but they bum rushed the stage with everybody else that was at the premiere, all these children, and they were dancing so hard. They had so much pride. And to me, that's what it's about is that these that we have all these children that are just really celebrating who they are. The first episode, Molly and Elizabeth, uh, that aired in uh, early November, we see Molly and Tui experience some stereotyping when some tourists come into town and expect a certain type of native to give them a tour of Kaya. And uh, they didn't want to receive the tour from you know, Molly and Tui as they were uh, dressed in our modern clothing. And Molly and Tui were very upset. And Grandpa Nat and Layla, uh, part of their, you know, family came in to share like this has been going on for a long time and Elizabeth Paratrovich stood up for our rights in 1945 to say that racism wasn't okay and helped to pass the first anti-discrimination act uh, that Governor Gruning signed for our state. Auntie Myrna! Shanya! Tui! Your grandpa told me what happened to you today. If I had been there, I would have given them a stern talking to. I'm a little glad we didn't have to see that. I asked Myrna to tell you about when she saw Elizabeth Paratrovich. You actually saw her? When I was just a little girl. <gasps> you were a little girl? <clears throat> I mean, of course you were. I'm just trying to picture your story. In 1945, Elizabeth was in Juneau. Stores in Juneau still refused to let Native people in. Elizabeth wrote letters and talked to lawmakers. 
She helped make a law that said you couldn't discriminate. You couldn't be unfair to Native people. Finally, the day came to decide on passing the law. I was watching. I must remind you, Senators, that Native people are treated unfairly in this state. How do you think Native children feel when they see signs that read, no Natives allowed, and aren't allowed in the same school as white children? Today, you can tell the world how we are treated as wrong and pass this law to make discrimination in Alaska illegal. After Elizabeth's powerful speech, the law passed. People couldn't keep Native people from entering a store or movie theater or anywhere else. Elizabeth Paratrovich was amazing. Yes, she stood up for Native people and it changed the minds of so many. This coin reminds us of all the hard work it took to gain equal rights for Native people. But there's still a lot of work to be done. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For more news, visit IndianCountryToday.com. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. I am Aaliyah Chavez. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run, you got to run.